right, 574 Sunshine of My Soul. There is sunshine in my soul today. Second Peter, a book that uh, you you inspired and that you moved along with your Holy Ghost, Lord. You, you, you breathed life into it and you moved a man to write this so that way even 2,000 years later, Lord, we could read it and we could get something from it and we could be encouraged and moved uh, uh, to continue on in doing what we're doing, Lord, and not to get weary and well-doing, not to faint, Lord, but to keep on keeping on, Lord. And uh, we're going to try and do that with the rest of our lives to the best of our abilities. And thank you for uh, this time that we have now. Now at this 10 o'clock hour, Lord, we would pray that you would open our hearts, Lord, that your, your word uh, would be preached and would be taught and that it would sink in, Lord, and that we would remember something. Lord, we would be encouraged from those words of Peter, Lord, those words, your words, and that we would do something with it. Lord, it wouldn't just come in there. It wouldn't just stay. But, Lord, it would be a muscular uh, kind of a Christianity and a lesson that we wouldn't forget. Lord, please bless this time that we have now. Uh, take care of the Hart family as they are traveling in Pennsylvania, God, and bring them back to us safely, Lord. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, please be seated. And I love singing. I love to sing. And sometimes if you haven't warmed up your voice, it can be rough. And you know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like a dog rough. I'm talking about... Well, if your voice is, it, it's a muscle right there inside of your throat. So sometimes you got to stretch it out. And so I need to stretch mine out this morning. Now, guess, 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 guess. Don't forget to invite people to church and Sunday school. And what you could do, Brody, you know what you could do? Here's what you do. You, you think of a fun way to give somebody an invite to, to church. And so you say, okay, what, what would be fun? Well, one year we tried to give out rocks. We painted rocks, remember? We put big googly eyes on him and we said this is your invite to church and we handed it to him and that was a lot of fun but the next year we had a really cool idea bro do you remember what we did we made tickets and they were a certain color we made golden tickets they were foil golden tickets and then we would give them out to people and it said vip it said vip seat if you come well if you have a sunday school class how do you make a vip seat for somebody so what we did is we went to walmart and we bought those cushions that you put on patio chairs, you know, outside. So we bought four just in case we had a lot of visitors. And so what we would do is we'd pull them out from the pulpit, we'd receive back our ticket, and then they would have a nice cushioned seat that they'd be able to sit on. But you think about something like that, and you say, what could I do to invite and make, uh, uh, make it special for somebody to come to Sunday school? And so when you do something like that, and then you get excited, and then you pray to God that he, he would set you up with something right there and you pray and believe you pray believing god will man it makes a difference it really does um, and so that's just something to keep in mind maybe this week if god lines you up with someone and, and you just invite them to church invite them to the sunday school hour and then what happens you start to see people come and then when you start to see people come and they're your guests man it's, it's exciting it's a lot of fun to see something like that and it starts to build up that um that kind of confidence that you have in inviting folks, and it's great. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to play a new game. We haven't played this one yet. It's called First Liners. First Liners. So here's what I'm going to do. I've got five first liners. Uh, the, first, the first verse 
in five different books. And it's your job to discern which book it is that this is coming out of. Okay, are you ready? And if you have an answer, you can raise your hand. All right, ready, here we go, the first one. Now you gotta listen for the clues. There are gonna be some words in here that are going to stick out. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, all right, so we got a couple of, of hints there. We were, there was a man, his name was Moses. It's not Exodus, you're right, it is not Exodus. Go ahead. That's a number? I'm not sure if it's wrong. Numbers. Numbers. The between Deuteronomy and Numbers. Now it's Numbers. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. Okay? So we're, this is clearly after they have come out of Egypt. So that's a good clue. In the tabernacle of the congregation. All right? So the tabernacle, this would have to be after Exodus because they, they built that at the end of Exodus. All right. Who's ready? Ready for the second one? All right. Now I did something a little tricky. And the Lord, here we go, this is the first line of another book. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, that's the first verse of another book in our King James Bible. Leviticus. It's Leviticus. Oh, no, now, he's about to give him the law. Yeah. It's, yep, he's about to. So what happens, they build that tabernacle. You've got chapters 25 through 40 in Exodus, and then you get to the next book, Leviticus, the first giving of the law. And what happens is the Lord speaks out of that doorway, out of that, uh, that door of the tabernacle. And so when you hear that, you know from Leviticus. All right, good. Now, oh, this is a good one right here. Ready? These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side, Jordan, in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Jizahat. Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy. It's good. All right, good. Now, how do we know that? Here's a way that I tried to memorize this one. If you think about Deuteronomy and then you look at the first couple of words, it sounds like, this is going to sound weird, it sounds like a pirate is saying it, okay? Now, just do your best pirate accent with me right there. Now. These be the words which Moses spake. Does that sound like a pirate? And then it's Deuteronomy. Come on, someone's got to do it with me. Brody, you're going to help me out. What does a pirate sound like? Arrgh. Judge, do they sound like that? Arrgh. No. All right, Brother Thomas, you're shaking your head. How does a pirate sound? Come on, it's just men in here. How does, how, what does a pirate sound like? And then if you look at the first, it just sounds like a pirate is saying this. These be the words which Moses spake. It sounds like a pirate. All right, we're going to move on. You guys, work on your pirate accents. We'll come back to it next week. That sounds, Judgey, what's a pirate sound like? <laughs> We're moving on. This is the first line in another book of the Bible. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a... What was that? Judges? No. Now it came... No. No, not judges. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He, his wife... His two sons. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So you have a time frame. This is the time when the book of Judges, this would have been right after Joshua, but not quite the time of the kings, not quite first and second uh, Samuel. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Ruth. Ruth. And if you remember what happens 
Uh, they go down into Moab, which they, is really them going out of the will of God. They leave that promised land. They leave that uh, safety and that comfort of the covenant community. And as they're over there, well, their two sons and the husband, they die. And so there is, uh, I believe it's Naomi. Naomi, and she's by herself. And so she's got these daughters-in-law, and they need to come back. And the, the famine has cleared out of the land, and here they come back. And it's a story of redemption. The story of our Redeemer. And we know who that Redeemer is? Jesus Christ. That's right. All right, here's the last one. This one's a little tough. All right, the first line in a book of the Bible. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites. And David had abode two days in Ziklag. First line. First line. First line. Second something. Second something. Nope. Second Samuel. Second Samuel. Now, whenever we talk to people about suicide, we always go to the uh, last chapter in First Samuel, and so we can recognize Second Samuel in that first line because it says right here. Now, it came to pass after the death of Saul, after the death of Saul, and so that's a good way to recognize the first line in Second Samuel. You did good. You did really good. I think you need to work on your pirate accents a little bit. But other than that, you did good. Uh, some of the things I wanted to go over, we have um, tomorrow. What's tomorrow? Uh, Labor Day. Yep. It's, it's yep. Labor Day. All right, what else? It's the 2nd of September. All right, second day in September. It's Labor Day. The um, event. There's an event. Chesapeake. And it's Monday. Yeah. So tomorrow... Monday is going to be the Western Roundup Revival in Chesapeake, and uh, I've already got confirmation of four of, of, of our church members who are going to be going down there, maybe five. Oh, yeah, I'll be there. Five people that are confirmed to go down. It's going to be a great time. Uh, it's going to be uh, free food at 6 o'clock, Brody, and you know what they're having tomorrow? So Tuesday is fried chicken, Wednesday is hamburgers, and then Monday night is subs. Sub, sub sandwiches or it's pizza. I don't know, but either one is going to be great. What's that? Uh, it could be. I don't really know what they're going to do. We personally here like to get Jimmy John's. So Peninsula Baptist is a Jimmy John's place, right? All right, I got one head. <laughs> you like them? All right, well, there's definitely a clear winner. You got to get the gargantuan at Jimmy John's. Now, all right, Saturday, that is going to be in six days. This coming Saturday is our Super Saturday of Soul Winning. What is it? Super well, it's a time when we all get to gather up, 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I believe the teen girls are going to be making breakfast for us. We're going to eat to the glory of God. It's all going to be free. And then at 10 o'clock, we'll have a message. And then, uh, Brother Justin, how good are you with numbers? Um, I'm actually going... I actually just went through it a while ago because I'm, I'm reading. Uh, no, 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 no. Numbers in your mind. Oh, like mathematical. Oh, yeah, I'm good. With what that. is 6 times 24? 6 times 24, that is 144. Is it really? 144? Yeah. Let me, let me pull up my calculator Please. just to check. If it is, I'm going to be extremely impressed. I think you're right. I did some quick math in my head. 100, yeah, 144. 144? Yeah. Okay, in a 144 hours from this moment, we're going to have a message after the 9 o'clock breakfast at the 10 o'clock hour uh, to encourage us to go out, and then right after that message in 144 and 15 minutes from this moment right now, we're going to be going out into our community, and we're going to be telling them about Jesus Christ. We're going to be telling them about the gospel and the good news, and we're going to be inviting them to come to church. Well, it made a, a huge difference in my life, and so that's why uh, we go out and we tell perfect strangers. We, we just go up and we knock on doors and we meet all kinds. But that's why we go out and we talk to perfect strangers, uh, because it made such a big difference, uh, a huge change. God made a great difference in my life, and so we try to tell people about that. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, September the 15th, is our Spare Bible Sunday. And so if you've noticed right here, what we've been doing is we've been collecting... Uh, Bibles for our Spare Bible Sunday, which is going to be September the 15th. And if you look over here, we were able to get black Bibles, pink, white, there's a purple one, and a blue one. 
And so we're trying to collect different colors too because sometimes it's just kind of neat, it's kind of fun. And so if you guys would like, please uh, bring a spare Bible on that day. And it'll be a great time where we get to gather up all these spare Bibles. And then when people come to our church, we'll be able to give them away for free. All because of your guys' hard work and your dedication and just giving. Just giving financially back, uh, it, it's a huge help. All right. That's going to be September the 15th. Now, what I'd like to do, we got about four or five minutes to uh, talk about praise and then prayer requests. So some of those things that we can say uh, to the Lord, you know, praise God and thank you. Is there, is there anything this morning that we can be praising God for? I believe there always is. Always, always. Praise God. Um, yes, sir. Praise God for life and uh, also for you know, meeting other Christians in our life. Yeah. 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 Yesterday, Brother Justin and I, after soul winning, went and got haircuts. And we went to a barber shop. And it turns out, I mean, they had crosses, they had Bibles. And then as I walked up to the booth, uh, the owner, which is Mr. Mack, he had um, this like placard tablet and it was all about the blood of Jesus Christ and how it saves. And so I said, hey, are you a believer? And so we talked and then uh, there was another pastor getting his hair cut down the row. Uh, his family, there was the owner's son, they're, they're both deacons in their church, and a Baptist church. And so that was really neat to, to see that. Life, uh, other believers running into them in the wild. It was pretty neat. Other believers I wanted to praise God for uh, the teen girls class that's going on right now. Teen girls class. And so obviously the Lord has blessed our church and sent young ladies. And so what are we doing? Well, we're going to, my wife is going to be training them because those young ladies are going to be, um, they're going to be wives one day. You know, they're going to be uh, the, the ladies who are um, going to be meet for, uh, what is it, a help meet for their husband, and so we're trying to train them to be a, like a biblical wife. What does that look like? What does that mean? And so obviously the Lord has sent and blessed in that way, and so if God opens a door, you know, walk through it. And so that's what we're doing right there. Any other praises? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Is there anything you can request? request? I would like to request that we're all praying for the Hart family. Hearts. As they are up in Pennsylvania, that God would just simply take care of them, bring them back here safely. We miss them. You know, we love them. They're a good family. They're, they're a staple. They're a faithful uh, Peninsula Baptist family that's always here, always helping. So not having them right there is weird. <laughs> what else could we, we, could we lift up to God? What else could we ask the Lord for? we got to get warm. we got to get some. I guess for William Whitehouse and his family. Pastor William, yeah. yeah. The White House. I have not gotten any updates or text messages or anything, and sometimes no news is good news. And so that's more than likely what it is. They're just very excited uh, about what they're doing right now. Hey, there's my other pen. It's my red one, too. I love this pen. Switch. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God. Lord, we love you, and uh, we love you because you first loved us. Lord, you died on a cross for my sins. You died on a cross for everyone here, their sins, and you died for the sins of the entire world. And God, you took that, that sin that you hate inside of your own body, and you paid for it with your life, with your blood, which you gave freely. You laid it down for us, God. This morning, I just wanted to slow down a little bit and say thank you for that. Lord, we need you. We need you uh, here and at this time. We need you as we go throughout our lives. Lord, we need you as we are driving. God, we need you as uh, we are going to be doing some traveling and going out to other churches and seeing uh, and some conferences. God, we need you in our lives at home as we're raising our families. Lord, we need you as we look at our family members who are lost and they're dying and they don't have maybe even any idea that they're on their way to hell. God, we need you to work in their lives. We, we're asking you now. And we're pleading with you, God. Please work in their lives and point them some way, supernaturally even, 
even, even to us so that way we can give them the gospel we can give them the good news and lord that's our our petition and our heart's desire we, we, we want to praise you, God, for the life that we have. And as we go out into our community and we carry on our lives and we see other believers, God, it lifts us up. It makes us happy to see something like that. It's encouraging when we see other believers, like-minded believers, people who have the gospel right, Lord. And uh, we just we see something like that, and it lifts us up. Praise your name for it. And also, Lord, uh, the teen girls class that is going on, the first one that we've had as a church. And uh, thank you so much that... We would just see that we have seen growth in our church and it's like uh, revival is starting to sweep across Hampton and we're seeing it we're seeing that you're adding to the church and Lord as you send them God we're gonna do our absolute best to train them we're gonna do our absolute best to keep them right here in the best possible place place that they can be in Lord and we know that it's not a sprint but it's a marathon God life is long and so the training that those ladies are getting right now are going to be preparing them for the rest of their lives Lord the Hart family is there in Pennsylvania. We pray now and we ask that you would put a hedge of protection around them, keep them safe, and allow them to get back safely to Virginia, uh, bring them back to Hampton. Lord, we, we love them and we miss them. And then also the White House family, wherever they're at in their journey, Lord, the same. Keep them safe and bless them. Uh, what a wonderful family that you were, uh, that you used to plant Peninsula Baptist Church. And Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, we pray all of these things. Amen. Amen. All right, now got your Bibles. Let's take them and turn to, what book are we in? Second Peter. Second Peter. All right, you guys are on it. You guys are sharp. Take your Bibles. You're going to be in Second Peter. That's in the Old Testament. <laughs> Whoa. Your looks could kill. All right. No, you guys are right. It's, we're nearing the end. And so what Pastor William had started, I don't know, probably at the beginning of this year, a little bit into it, was going through every book of the Bible. So if there's 66, let's do math. If there's 66 and we're almost done, then I guess actually he would have had to have started last year. So you guys have been going through this for a while. I came in and started it, uh, started doing this Sunday school, going through the books at Romans. And I remember because I used my first time here, the first time I spoke with y'all, uh, also was my testimony. Judgy, sit down, son. Sit down. Uh, it was my testimony, and so I was able to use my testimony and Romans at the same time. Son, if you're disobedient, I'm going to have to take you somewhere and whoop you. Are you going to listen? Very good. Don't do that. Sit down. So we are now at the second epistle of General Peter. The general, general, <laughs> not general? No. General. general oh, yes. the general. Uh, okay. So a general epistle. So we've talked about that a couple of times now. What is, Brother Thomas, what do you suppose a general epistle means? You were to write, oh, okay, so imagine you're at school. Who's, what's your best friend's name? Is it Brett? Brent. B-R-I. Brent? I've never met a Brent before. Your best friend, Brent. So you write a note. You write a note, and you label it to Brent, and then you pass it over there, or however you get notes to people nowadays. You probably don't do that, right? You just text. Uh, but you pass a note to Brent, and so there are things that are specifically in there that are written to Brent. To your best friend. Now, there's also another way that you could write a letter, and it's a general way. It's not saying to Bryn, but it would rather be like to um, my school or to my algebra class or whatever it is. It's a general audience. It's not specifically to a person. It's not like, like Titus or Timothy would be, but it's actually to a general audience like this region of people, this region of folks. So what Second uh, Peter, you know, he's writing a general letter, a, a letter to a group of folks, and really it's to, if you were to guess, what do you think? That general, who, like, who do you think he's writing a general epistle to? Yeah, Christians. He's writing to Christians, and specifically he's writing to those first century Christians, right around 60 A.D., all right, and if, we, if you remember from last week, we'll be able to draw a little bit of information. Now, this is an open book test. How many chapters do we have in 2 Peter? Three. Three? All right, good. It's quick. It's good. Uh, we have three, you know, short chapters, but these are, are, are probably within uh, the realm of, like, ap apologetics or, or dating uh, uh, of who wrote this. Probably the most contested book in the Bible is 2 Peter. There's a whole lot of discussion, heated discussion, 
about the authorship, about the doctrines that are located within it. And so probably the one that gets argued over the most, which is odd, would be 2 Peter. Now, you're a Bible believer. I'm a Bible believer. Who wrote it? Peter. 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 Now, people will debate this. I mean, Peter, you think about uh, who, who was Peter? He was just a fisherman. You know, he, he was probably not educated. Uh, and so when people read 1 Peter and then they read 2 Peter, that you can you can see a difference in it. 1 Peter is written more elegant, more beautiful. This is what they're saying. And then when you get to 2 Peter, it seems as if it's more rough and it's more tough and it's written more like Peter would write. So the authorship has always, always, always been contested about exactly who wrote it. I'm a Bible believer. Verse 1, 1 Peter, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So there we see who wrote it, Peter. I'm just going to believe that. I'm going to believe it's Peter. You can get into all sorts of discussion. And then who's it written to? It tells us right there also, to them that have obtained like precious faith. What, what, what saves us? Our faith. And so he's writing, Peter is writing to those who have faith. He's writing to the saved. He's writing to the Christians of the first century. All right, now, here, here's something. When was it written? And was it written, I kind of already told you, but about in the like, 60 80s, right in the 60s, and we know that because of the persecutions that are being written of during that time, there was uh, a, a man who was, uh, he was a mad tyrant. He was known as the Beast, uh, the great poor of Babylon at that time. It was um, the one who brought much persecution to the Christians at that time. In Rome, Emperor Nero. We talked about him last week. And so 1 Peter, 2 Peter, written very similar in time, probably about a year to a year and a half in between each. And this was written right at the end of Peter's life. This is uh, probably the last epistle that he wrote before he was martyred in Rome. And so Peter, not wanting to die like his Lord, uh, decided to be crucified uh, upside down because he didn't want to be uh, he said he wasn't even worthy to be crucified like Christ was. Peter, Peter, why was why was Second Peter written? The book, why was it written to us? You know, what's the point when you write a letter to Bren and you want to say something to your best friend? You have a purpose for writing it. You're not just writing willy nilly. You're not just putting out you know this and that. You're you're trying to get something across to him. And so, why is Peter? Why is God? Why does the Holy Ghost uh, inspire and move? Uh, why was this written down for us? Now, Peter, he was, he was seen and he was alarmed at how much false teaching was coming into the church. And so over and over and over and over, we see in these epistles, after the death of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the New Testament church, even then, false teachings were creeping into the church. And so over and over and over, Peter and Paul and Titus and Timothy, they, they're always... Jude, they're combating that false teaching that's coming in, and they're exhorting everybody, do not let it come in. Do not let this false uh, gospel come in and change anything. What you've been taught, you got the right stuff, stick with the stuff. And it's no different in 2 Peter. It's this, uh, the same exact thing. Hey, there's false teachers that are coming in. There's false teachers that will arise among us. Hey, those false teachings, you need to shun them. They need to be out of the church. You need to call it out. So Peter actually encourages the Christians. What he writes to us uh, is that we need to be able to detect, and we need to be able to combat heresy and false teachings and teachers that creep into the church. Uh, you know, we if that's going to be possible for us to detect and combat, then we as Christians are going to have to grow to be able to do something like that. You know, we don't take uh, eight-year-olds. We don't take four-year-olds and send them out onto the battlefield. They need to grow up, mature, and get trained, and then be equipped, and then sent out. Even you, Brother Thomas, if I were to take you and just give you a gun and give you a vest and say, go that way and shoot, you are not going to be effective like a Navy SEAL, grown man, who has training, who has a toughness, a maturity in his mind, uh, somebody who's been doing it for a long time. It's completely different. And so here's Peter saying, Christians, there is going to be false teaching. There's already false teaching. But you need to mature. You need to grow up. And you need to be ready to detect and to combat these false teachers and these teachings that are coming into the church. 
Some of them are going to be aggressive. Some of them are going to maybe even know the scriptures better than you. But there might be twistiness. So that's why it's so important that you know the exact doctrines that you've been taught. So that way they can't come in and start messing and, and twisting the things. You know, 2 Peter stresses the authenticity of the word of God and assures the reader of the imminent return of Christ as well. And so there were the, the Gnostics at that time. And, and they, they died out, but they're actually making kind of a turn right now. They believe that spirit and material are different. Yes, I, I believe that as well. Well, they say all spirit is holy. Uh, I, I'm not sure about that, actually. But they do say that all material, that's going to be anything physical, is sinful, it's wicked, it's rotten, it's evil. And therefore, and because of that, they called themselves Gnostic Christians. So they, they, they took Christ. But they said because of that, Christ, uh, uh, Christ himself, Jesus Christ, could not have ever came in the flesh. But he was actually always just here as spirit and only spirit. The resurrection, he was resurrected in spirit. Uh, and so you have to be very careful. There, there's men that we ran into yesterday. And so they're wearing all purple. And they're out there with their loudspeakers on the corner. And they're <laughs> preaching a false gospel. And they're, they're telling um, yeah, they're racist. They're a hate group. They're, they're being very, very open and vocal about it. And so there is nothing Christ-like in that. But they know their Bible. They know they could take you to some obscure chapter, you know, 2 Kings 16, and then use that to try to tie it in together with how uh, I'm a slave owner, you know, something like that. And what does that have to do with it? But, but that's, the, that's the thing is Peter is telling us, God is telling us, you better learn your Bible. And you better know what you're talking about. And you better know what you believe. Because there are, uh, it's a jungle out there with all sorts of beliefs. People that take maybe even the King James. And, and they're going to make their own belief out of it. They're going to make some kind of a obscure, weird uh, kind of a belief. And if you don't have a ground, if you don't have a, a solid foundation, well, you can come away thinking that you're a god. You know, when Jesus says, had you not read that you're a god? And so now when we run into people like yesterday, a, a nice man, a gentleman, really, Somewhat, but he can, you know he comes away from the Bible and he says, well, first of all, that book is not infallible. That book has problems. And you're already on shifting sands right there. And then he says, you know, how do you, I, I say, how do you know you're going to heaven? Oh, I know I'm going to heaven because God told me. I said, oh, great. And he says, I know I'm God. Because God told me that he's going to come inside of me. I'm God. And now, by the way, we're all God and we're all going to heaven. Oh, he's a mess. People can go into the scriptures, and they can say all sorts of different things. And if you are not 100% solid on what you believe and what you know the Bible says and what it means, then people can come into your life, into your mind, and cause you to doubt, cause you to question, cause you to think something that may not be true. Now, is that dangerous? So Peter writes to us, and he says that is absolutely dangerous. So I'm going to write some things to you to encourage you to grow to encourage you to mature, so that way when these things happen, and they absolutely will happen, you're going to be uh, you're going to be ready for it. You know, I'm going to prepare you for that battle. I'm going to warn you now, versus letting it just come in, creep in, and happen. Why do so many people, when they turn 18 years old, they've been raised in a Christian family, maybe? Why do so many of them run the first chance that they get away from God? You know, talk to so many people and ask them why, and they say, "Well, I never had a uh, you know." I never had a love for God. My parents never explained to me why we did what we're doing. They never opened up the Bible and said, here's what it says. Here's what it means. They never prepared those people for it. They never instilled a true love for God, the creator, the savior of our soul inside of, inside of their kids. And so when they get the chance, they have no idea what they believe. They have no foundation. And they leave. And they go. And they say, I'm going to go do my own thing. Now, that is extremely dangerous to go and do your own thing. I went and did my own thing. And let me tell you, it was not, not good. It, it, it left a lot of scars in my life, a, a lot of pain, heartaches, a lot of things I still have to deal with, and my family as well. I'm not going to get into all the details of it. But I was not given a love. I, I never had a true appreciation in my own life for Jesus Christ. I didn't get saved until I was 28, and by that time I had 10 years of living my own life however I wanted to do things. And it led me from, you know, being very prideful and pompous and doing selfish things in my own life, and God said, okay, and he humbled me.
brought me to the lowest, most depressing, uh, loneliest time in my entire life. And that's, that's right where God got me. That's where God got me. And I don't want that for anybody. Maybe that's what it takes for some people to hit that rock bottom. Let me tell you, it's a terrible fall and it's a hard hit. You know, the, the, it's, it's not, the school of hard knocks is not without its own tuition cost. There's a cost. And it could be something that you're going to regret or live with for the rest of your life. But what you could do, what you absolutely could do, is you can search now and you can get firm on what you believe. Now, I wanted to go over a couple of the key verses that are in 2 Peter. Um, let, me, let me tell you some that you're going to recognize if you go and you look at verse 3. Chapter 1, you're going to recognize this one. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. That's 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. And just like it, verse 4, whereby are given unto us what? Exceeding great and precious promises. What, what does that mean? They're, they exceed our expectation. They're precious, those promises. Things. You can't stand on a, a promise of God if you don't know what it is. You're, you're like shifting sand, but we have this more sure word of, of prophecy. We have this foundation. Uh, go to the next one. It's verse 19, chapter 1. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. You know, that's a very famous verse uh, regarding the infallibility and the inspiration of our scriptures. We have a more sure word of prophecy. And, you know, no prophecy came in old time by the will of man, but it was actually, it, it came from God. God gave us these words, these scriptures right here as he saw fit. Now you go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, you're going to recognize this one right here and in verse 9. You should already know this one. If you've been coming to soul winning, first Peter or second Peter chapter three and verse nine. Oh, you know it. The Lord is not slack concerning his what? Promise. Promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word. What's that word long suffering mean? What's that? Patience. Patience. Long suffering. You know, as I'm going through a suffering, as I have to watch my kids try to clean the house. You know, I'm so, I'm literally just like, oh, I, I wish they would do it this way, you know, but I'm long suffering. I'm patient with them as I'm helping them along with it. God is long suffering. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. He's, he's patient towards us because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance, come to repentance. God is patient. Even with those men who are out there spewing hate, God is patient even with the ones who deny him day after day after day after day. And he extends his gospel. He extends his good news to all these people. He is patient with them and he gives them time. He gives them maybe a long time. Maybe he gives them years. And he says, I, all day long I've extended my hand unto you, but you haven't accepted me. You haven't listened to me. But he's patient. Even when people spit in his face and buffet him, they, they speak all, toward, all sorts of wicked, disgusting things about Jesus Christ or about God. And they say, uh, your God is not real. Your God is fake. Your God is made up. Your God was born of a, of a woman who was uh, a spouse to another man and she cheated on him. And, and your God, Jesus Christ, is actually just a bastard child. And then God's up in heaven and he's not like us. God up in heaven looks down on all of those terrible things that, that they say or they do against God. And they say, you know what? And God says, you know what? I'm going to be long-suffering with them. I'm going to be patient, and I'm going to continue to extend my hand, and I'm going to continue to allow them to, to hopefully come to me. That's what I desire. That's what I want. That's 2 Peter chapter 3. And then the last verse, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. This is the last one we'll look at. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be glory both now and forever amen uh, a number of sunday schools all across america no doubt all across the world are called grow in grace or growing in grace because as christians we're commanded to do it we see it right there in second peter grow in grace and in the knowledge 
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I have a brief summary right here of all sorts of things, uh, but it looks like we're not going to be able to get to it. But just as those Christians in the first century uh, were, were they, they were thought that they were near to the Lord's return, we are even so much more than nearer. And it's still important for us to continue to grow and to grow and to grow so that way when those false doctrines and those false teachers come in here or they rise up in here of our own or we see them out there, that we can know and we can stand on a, on a foundation. That is the reason why first or, or first and second Peter was written to us. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you, God. We need you very much, Lord. Thank you for being long-suffering toward us. Help us to grow as Christians. And thank you for this book of Second Peter that we can read uh, from Peter to us, the believers, to the people who have by faith received your eternal gift of salvation. Lord, help us, God, to uh, tell other people uh, to spread that gospel message and to know uh, what we stand on and to know what we believe because what your Bible tells us. Lord, help us to stand on those promises. Help us to find out, seek, and believe those promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, that's 2 Peter. You are dismissed.